when it finally dawned on me who are professors in the country. So we're going to clap in a special way, ladies and gentlemen, and it's quite easy, okay? Aren't we all excited? It's quite easy. You go, when I say the great launch key, do you say one, two, three, one, two, three, then everybody as well, so to, if you emulate, if you put off your head, anything, okay? So let's practice and see how it goes. Basu to key, do one, two, three, one, two, three. To you. So you bring up new things, not the normal. So we're going it the great launch style. One, two, three, one, two, three. Ilele, take off your head, then the LDF. That's how we clear for the great professor and the launch. Quite easy, isn't it? It is. <laughs> it's easy. That's good. Yeah. Onto the so, stage, I would like to call upon the LDF chaplain C for the opening prayer. Hare Rapidi. Father God, we come to you today as we facilitate the great launch. Mosebezi Wamatowa. At this point in time, we'd like to call upon Advocate Macheta Mutwari, who also has his book authored today. So, Dajem Mutwari, Advocate, welcome to the stage. Bon Melbourne, Dati. You are looking great. I, I just heard someone saying, it seems like this event is not the event of its own magnitude. Why can't we just uh, a little bit shout uh, to show that we are happy? Are we all happy to be here today? Oh, yeah. I, I, I doubt. Are we all happy to be here in the midst of Professor? I'm happy. Oh. All right, I'm at least hearing the side. My left side, I hear absolutely nothing. Can I hear this side? Are you happy to be in the midst of Professor today? Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Indeed, you are looking quite good. And you deserve a pair on the shoulder. And you are going to give it to yourself. Can you just give yourself a pair on the shoulder? Just because you are looking beautiful. <laughs> Very much. Uh, my names, as uh, program director had said, are as follows. Macheta is the first name, and the middle name is Julius. The last name is Mutwabi. And by God's grace, in the year 2006, His Majesty King Lizzie the Third at least gave me the title advocate and uh, I'm honored for that matter thank you very much program director I know you have uh, at least given me ch this chance to acknowledge the beauty that I'm seeing today this is indeed beautiful in our eyes and marvelous and I wish as we start this ceremony all of us, we can just be happy until the last moment when we leave this place. And let me, at this juncture, take this advantage to say it was not so easy to have invited a person of uh, Professor's caliber and also organizing such event as this one, it was not so easy. But we thank God that against all odds, today we are with him today. And we thank God for 
uh, this opportunity because that's only him. Yesterday when we were told that the, the, the flight was supposed to go back with him back to our tambu, then we asked holy angels and say, angels, are we sure this is going to happen? And the answer was in the affirmative. And we are happy for that. And on behalf of the foundation, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all to this great launch of the two books. As Elia stated, the recoil, Days of the Haunting, Part 2, and the Momo by Advocate Muswari, titled Against All Odds. This is an extremely important beginning, an incubation of great work by the foundation, Butada Kennedy Silas Foundation. And I welcome you all to this event, particularly our keynote speaker, Professor P.L. Lumumba. He is the founder of the PLO, Lumumba Foundation, who has traveled to be with us today to this great lodge. Allow me, Madam Program Director, to acknowledge the presence. I've seen the presence of uh, Professor Ngusamahau in our midst, and uh, we are saying welcome, you, sir. And also, we acknowledge the presence of uh, Advocate Busiu. May we welcome you. Advocate yourself. So far, I've mentioned advocates only. Also, Dr. Hama, uh, the PS of uh, Ministry of Education, we have seen you, sir. Welcome. Brigadier General Matamani, welcome you, sir. Major General Matubakele, welcome you, sir. And Lieutenant General Lesuela, thank you very much, sir. We see you and we acknowledge uh, the stages that you have taken to be uh, with us till today. I also want to commend and extend my warm greetings to all personalities who are with us today. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, let's just enjoy. Professor, your presence here means a lot to Basutu in general. I know, I know your heart when it comes to Africa as a continent. Mine was just to do the opening remarks. And I know I have mastered that. I did exactly what I was supposed to be doing. Thank you very much. I've done my part. Thank you. Thank you. So let's give him the great launch applause. The great launch key. No? One, two, three. One, two, three. <laughs> Okay, so Advocate Mutari has mentioned that the great literature, every nation's history lies in its own literature. We can attest to that, right? We can attest to the Egyptian literatures, we can attest to our very own literatures that we have like the last time that David Tata was launching the book, he quoted the works of the day Thomas Mokoku. We still have him. Even to this day, the works of the David Tata, the works of the Basutu are going to be embedded in our books and we get to cherish them for generations to come later on. It is with these two books today that we're launching that literature we are writing our own history. Our kids will learn the literature. They will forever remember this day that we grade, launched, hoisted the very prestigious professor. For that, we say thank you. At this point in time, though I don't see it in our midst, I would like to welcome our performances by Morena Sue. It's um, a 
great honor for me to be standing here. And uh, I thank God to the Almighty because he has created this day. And uh, we shall not only rejoice in it, we are going to be productive in it. I salute the leadership of uh, Lesotho Defense Force, particularly the Daily Zoela and uh, your great team that is with you today. And uh, I don't know whether Captain Miladu is here. If you are there, wave your hand. If you are not, I will thank you in absentia. Because Kikava Galanta de Miladu healing a part and parcel of this great event. Uh, Professor Limumba, what an honor to be sharing a stage with you. I'm going to learn a lot from you, physically, not virtually. I've learned a lot from you virtually. Thank you so much for honoring my country for coming here. Um, I thank all the speakers that are going to speak. Lilo nabo melebontati kili lebo wa kuminahani na ki fielding in our twinky personal development kama nzo yaman ki motivate abatu. Motivation is not motivation without people that are being motivated. So thank you for being here. You know, I love life because once in a while in life, we need to pause and applaud. We have just paused from our very, very, very busy lives and we are here to applaud you in the day silence. We are here to applaud you. We have paused to applaud you, my learned friend, Advocate Mutari. I don't see him, he was sitting somewhere then. In the day silence, we thank you for a job well done. You have written not one book, you have written two. And uh, speaking as an author myself, I know that's a lot of work to do. Congratulations, sir. Can you continue to shine? Lesotho needs people of your caliber. <laughs> Nothing beats sharing a story to pass a message, to pass a critical principle, stories. So continue to write, sir. Let me just talk about Advocate Mutwari a little, a little, because there's a message that I want to pass there. When you live a life of purpose, when you know your calling, God has this way of rearranging life, rearranging life in such a manner that you will get to meet the people that you need to work with. I met Advocate Mutwari in a very strange way. I was doing my event uh, at um, Maseru Yavani, and I get a call from uh, one of my competitors, somebody who's in the personal development industry. He calls me and says, you know what, I was expecting a speaker from South Africa, and uh, this speaker is no longer coming. Can you come and fill the gap? I said, sure, I'll come and fill the gap. And I think that was a way for God to show me uh, advocate Mutwari, we met, and ever since we met, uh, that was in 2014, we have done things with him. I celebrated a birthday at his home at Edili, and he was doing it in a very, very, very celebrating Limozi, celebrating a birthday Limozi. We met again in that day, Lizuela. Rangers. 
we went ourselves into that initiative. I remember I called Advocate Motswari in the morning and telling him that, you know what, at 10 o'clock I'm going to motivate. Banabaro Nabashoka to motivate. Dr. Motswari is a high ranking official, and the notice that I gave him was very, very low ranking. But because he doesn't have an ego, he came, he joined us. I just wanted to give you a, an idea as to how I got to know um, Advocate Motswari. Okay, the book that uh, talks about his life, I want to piggyback on that title. And uh, that will be the subject matter of my speech. Because I believe, all of us, we want to succeed. Not only do we want to succeed, we want to move from success to greatness. And you cannot achieve that if you are not prepared to beat the odds, you have to say against all odds. And then I'm going to unpack succeeding against all odds. What does it entail? I'm going to share you just a few, a few things that you need to be mindful of. That is if you want to succeed. That is if you want to elevate yourself to greatness. Uh, let me start by sharing a Chinese proverb that I came across. It says, if you learn something of value, something that has transformed your life, you have a moral duty, you have a moral obligation to share it. And uh, I'm going to share some of the principles that have impacted my life. And I'm not saying that I, I've arrived. No, I'm working in progress. I haven't arrived. <clears throat> but I'm going to share you some of the things that will help you in your journey of life. Succeeding against all odds entails patience. Patience. I have a lot of people who Take baby steps. And what I need to remind you of all of us, without exception, who were born with the perseverance muscle. Why am I saying that? I'm saying this because a baby will take the first step and fall down. Will that stop a baby from standing up again and redoing it? No. The baby will stand up again and do it until the baby is firmly grounded. And it looks like as we grow up, we lose the perseverance muscle. We lose that. Adulthood drops us that we want things and we want them now. But at a quick fix, we want to have success, we want to have greatness without searching for it. Patience. Somebody once said that patience eliminates men's work and invites God into the picture. A mountain climber does not jump onto a mountain. A mountain climber is a man step by step, step by step until he gets to the top of the mountain. And that is silence. When you wrote a book, it was a step by step process. And then you wrote a sentence, and then you wrote a paragraph, a page, a chapter. Everything, baby step, you have to be patient. Success will never, I'm talking sustainable success, it will never, you never start it from the top, never. In fact, the only thing that I know that is started from the top, you know, when you dig a grave, you start from the top, and then you go down. Look at you, how about you? I'm a lawyer, a corporate lawyer, by the way. It's a little business. And uh, I, I, I get to be so discouraged and so amazed. People complain that, you know, the banks are so hopeless, the banks are so unfriendly, the banks are this and this and that. Because they want huge amounts of money to start these huge projects. You don't start like that. The only thing that starts from the top 
down is the cliff. When the choir, when the choir sings with the anointing, I see Jesus in them, and I say, Amen, Hallelujah. And when they sing of key, I just look behind them, and I see Jesus. God bless you. Wow, 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 wow. That's all we could say. Let's all give me we see who the, the great launch. Clap. We still remember that one? <laughs> three times, three times. The great launch key, you know? Three. One, two, three. <laughs> We're going to have some live performance by the LDFO. Welcome to the stage. <laughs> Tourism, culture, and environment to give us a speech. He has been given that Thank you very language. much, uh, Program Director. My name is Motalepula Letivelane, as Mayor Program Director has uh, introduced me. Working for the Ministry of Tourism environment and culture. Uh, I'm based at the State Library and Archives. State Library and Archives is a department, one of the, the main departments in the Ministry of Tourism, Environment and Culture. Allow me to Pay my respect to His Majesty King Letzi III, the Right Honourable Prime Minister, Ntate Mwekezi Majoro, Honourable Deputy Prime Minister, Ntate Matiberi Mokhotu, Honourable Ministers, Honourable Members of Parliament, uh, as Ntate Motswari has indicated we have in our midst uh, Ndate Mahau, one of our senators. Thank you, Ndate. Your Excellencies, heads of diplomatic missions and heads of international organizations, uh, we, we note with honor the presence of the commandment of uh, Lesotho Defense Force distinguished guests, our media fraternity, ladies and gentlemen. Allow me to say a little bit about uh, the State Library and Archives, uh, one of the departments as I have indicated. We are a department responsible for collecting collating and making available uh, information in many forms that it can be available. Books are the main sources of information that we deal with. We, we want to make it clear to you that uh, the State Library is a national library, and the main responsibility of the National Library is to collect the books and other documents written by Basutu and about Lesotho. 
We collect them, keep them for posterity. We keep them for, uh, for, for, for us who are, who are still alive now and for those who will be coming even uh, in, 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 in eternity, if, if I may put it that way. So it makes it clear that Ndate Silasi has done exactly what we, we like. As mandated to collect those books, we are proud that Ndate, you have written this book. Uh, sorry, these books. Like the pro program director has indicated, we, we were with you uh, when you were launching the first book um, in uh, health headquarters. We are also with you today. It makes us very proud. It is yet another important day in the history of book writing in our country. The Kingdom of Lesotho, like all the countries of the world, deserves an environment symbolized by the presence of literature. We are a country that has, like many countries, a wealth of undocumented fictional and non-fictional stories to tell the world. It is this literature that we have been passing from generation to generation, but through our oral tradition. We are now in the information age. It is in this age that technology, especially in the form of computers and internet, have made it easier and compels us to proceed about how to have a share in the information world. We are bound to think of the best ways that those interesting stories we acquired from our ancestors could be turned to fit into the new world, the digital world. We have already lost a lot of, a lot of our stories because of our, our over-reliance on our oral culture. We generate stories on daily and timely basis. These stories have to be shared. We are responsible for making ourselves recognized in the information society. We need to write books, audio books, and audio visuals. We have to enable access to information in all the possible facets. Ladies and gentlemen, let us continue to generate our affection for books and book writing. Books create authors. They create jobs for, book, for editors, publishers, and librarians. Books enable book clubs and bookstores. We need books for young and adults. We need books for the betterment of our education system. We need books in our schools, at home, and everywhere. Through books, we build our physical, mobile, and virtual libraries. We need books to develop our social, economic, and our political structures. We need books in all the spheres of our lives. Books build nations. Books are the backbone of our creative and cultural industry. Books build our knowledge and our knowledge economy. Alfin Tovler, in his book called Future Shock, says that the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read or write, but those who cannot learn and learn and relearn. We need books to keep abreast with the ever-changing paradigm shifts. The moment we pause is the time we remain aback and overtaken by important events. Those who do not partake in the information revolution will find it extremely hard to catch up. Even though we started some time ago to put our creativity creativity into paper. It took quite some time for us to broaden our writing culture. Writing could support our indigenous publishing 
create jobs, support our education, economy, and develop all our sectors of life. We are aware of the emergence and the preponderance of a new crop of authors in our country. We are launching these beautiful books in an important year in the calendar of the Kingdom of Lesotho. We are celebrating as part of the African Union a year that is given the following theme. Arts, culture and heritage leave us for building the Africa we want. Africa notes that for us to reach our Agenda 2063, we need to consider the importance of arts, culture and heritage. We are aware that our, strategic, our National Strategic Development Plan 2 considers a culture and creative industry. This is an important response for the Kingdom of Lesotho to achieving the Africa we want. Let me conclude these few remarks by thanking the author of these important books. We have in our midst the, gi the giants like Professor Patrick Lumumba, our important guest, who is very popular with telling it like it is. He never minces words when it comes to national, African, and global issues. We will wait, but with impatience, to hear the, the message he has for us. We are not surprised that he is here. Ndate Butata Silasi is our giant. Writing books while still a soldier is, is not very common. Keep soldiering on, Ndate. Our heartfelt, <laughs> our heartfelt gratitude also goes to all of you who have contributed in making this occasion a success. Khoto, Pula, Nala. Thank you. At this point in time, we would like to have a performance while our very own Major General Maduba Kelly prepares himself to give us a convocation. We have Morena Soy with us. Director, rightfully you call me Major General Matubagire, the Deputy Chief of Defence Staff, the Zulu Defence Force. Uh, let me also observe the protocol, protocol that have been observed without making a lot of mistakes. I have to follow as it is because I have seen that there are a lot of distinguished guests here that I am a conglomerate and I'm trying to elaborate the way it has been done. I can just shortly say, ladies and gentlemen, generals and distinguished guests. Before I can uh, go forward, I want to reiterate what you have said program director. The good saying is says the animals have got the nice history from the nature. But because they don't know how to write it, it is being written by the hunters. And the hunters do the way they please. That literally means 
most of us here, we have very really good news. But since we don't write them, somebody from somewhere writes them the way he pleased. So this is the launching pad for the writers to write the history, to write the news. Like these books that we are seeing here, the books that we are launching here, they mark the giant step forward. Let me say, you will recall that the military, in the military, the writing is known since the beginning of evolution. The military, most of the case, are being deployed in and outside the country. And there, the end of their deployments, they write the reports, the either incident reports or whatever reports, that subsequently create the history. That is why sometimes, long time ago, the Roman soldiers were deployed at Palestine and other areas of the Middle East. And when they went back, they wrote a lot of reports about the incidents and details that have been done there. Later on, the generals in the room, they decided that... Don't forget that the military task is already demanding the double effort. So if that is a case, and you are also a writer, that means now you have a very little time to spare. I may therefore invite this Ocas House to clap our hands, to applaud and congratulation, to congratulate him, I mean, this young man uh, for achieving such a remarkable and demanding job uh, that not everyone or everybody can do, but while everybody can enjoy. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, concluding this my very short speech, I like to say, as much as I can say, I want to say thank you. I want to say, Moido Obrigado, Messi Boko, Spaziva, Asande Sana, Shukran Katir, Shie Shie Nye. Thank you. At this point in time, let's give him our great launch applause. We got it right? Yes. Good. Yes. Fire up. Fire up. The great launch key. No? The great launch key, no? At this point in time, let's welcome Brigadier General T. Matai for edification of the offer. While we're still waiting for that, Mateng, can you please get ready? Dada Matai, welcome to the stage. Uh, thank you very much, Madam. Program Director. Uh, my, my name is Mataman, not Matai, for correction. It is my great honor to be given this opportunity to come and stand here to talk about this young soldier, Private Silas. Especially, uh, this private is working directly with me. Uh, Madam Program Director, allow me to align my, my, myself with protocol orders as alluded by the previous speakers. As correctly said, uh, I'm Brigadier Mataman. My task today is very simple. I'm just going to talk about this young soldier, Private Silas to tell you who this private is, where he's from. 
Private Silas is the founder of the Butata Kennedy Silas Foundation. Deputy Director of the Patrick Law Odieno Lubumba Foundation, the Soto Chapter. Award winning international novelist who works under a close supervision of a liter literary agent, Michael Thomas Kilbaniski, from the United States of America. Private Silas is also an international orator, speech writer, host writer, and airman at Lesotho Defense Force Air Wing, with eight years of service. Private Silas was born on the 17th March 1991 and raised in a small village called Mahubung in the district of Liribe. He attended his primary school. He attended his primary school at Mahubung Primary School in the year 2003. He proceeded to Hitis High School, where he obtained merit and first class pass for junior and Cambridge Overseas School Certificate in 2006 and 2008, respectively. In 2009, Private uh, Silas furthered his studies with the National University of Lesotho in bachelor degree in mathematics and computer sciences. In 2013, he was enlisted into the Sudo Defense Force as a recruit, and in March 2014, he was promoted to the rank of a private. He was then deployed at 13 Infantry Battalion till December 2015, where he was transferred to Mijamitalana Air Base, and he was deployed at Rotary Squadron as apprentice. Private Silas was the three Basutu authors who were nominated for the inauguration annual Mole Fort African Literature Award, which was held in Kaburone, Botswana. The famed novelist brought the award of the best novelist with his debut novel, Ilinyone Na the Requel, on the 7th March 2021. The recoil was launched at the Ministry of Health Auditorium on the 28th February 2020 by the Honorable Speaker of the National Assembly, Ndades Pirim Danyan. The recoil has become one of the best silly novels on the international platform, such as Amazon and Smart Words. Owing to that, Private Silas was invited to represent Lesotho at the 2021 Commonwealth Short Story Competition. Uh, allow me to say, this is what I can say with uh, Private Silas. It is as brief as I have just said. Thank you very much. He has awards. If Mungahai can speak like this, about that they would have, don't you all wish we would have those agglomerates and accolades that he has achieved on himself? Aren't you all happy that we have a person of his calibre in our midst that we can get the aura? <laughs> we should be very happy for that. For that we say thank you. And for before we call upon Private Butata Kennedy Silasi we would like to have Martin give us a little bit of performance. There she is. While we're still welcoming her to the stage, let's give ourselves a great launch key, you know? The great launch key, you know?
So, at this point, we go into welcome the men of the hour, our best selling international offer, Mr. Votada Kennedy, Kennedy Selassie. We are here for the launch of He Two Books. It is an honor, privilege, and everything we can think of to have him in our midst. That David Tata, we welcome you, we thank you for your life, we thank you for the gift that you give us, and we thank you for the books. Welcome to the stage that day. Can you all give him a standing ovation? <laughs> Allow me, Program Director, Madam, to reimburse my special respect and acknowledgement to His Majesty King Lizzie III, the Right Honorable the Prime Minister of the Government of Lesotho, Dr. Mwike Zimajoro, the President of the Senate, the Honorable Speaker of the National Assembly, His Lordship the President of the Appeal Court, His Lordship Chief Justice, Honorable Deputy Prime Minister, Honorable Ministers, their Lordships, Ladyships, Honorable Judges of the Superior Courts, their Excellencies, Heads of Diplomatic Delegation in Lesotho, the Chairman of the Teaching Service, Barutva Mushwesha, Principal Secretaries, the Chief of Defense Staff, Lieutenant General Mujalfar Zwer, LD of General Staff, Senior Officers, Junior Officers, Force Sergeant Major, Senior Non-Commissioned Officers, junior non-commissioned officers, brave soldiers of Lesotho, and the rank of boy. Our guest speaker and my mentor at the PLO Lumumba Foundation, Professor Patrick Locke Otieno Lumumba, the doyen of legal profession, my lawyer, advocate Keketo Paxis, who is in our midst, members of media houses, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, all the academics who are present today, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, with that, I would like to say all protocol observed. It lightens my heart this afternoon to recognize that it is my utmost privilege and honor as the author of the recoil to Days of the Haunting Past and Against All Odds to bid you welcome to this ceremonial commissioning of the aforementioned books. May I, without ado, also express my heartfelt gratitude to you for having spent some time of your busy schedules to come celebrate and commemorate this very fundamental occasion with us. Actually, I've read my mind and heart for what I ought to say to you today. I then decided to entitle my speech, Challenges That Basutu Authors Sekamba To in the Contemporary Lesotho and What Can Be Done to Catapult Lesotho from this malady that has afflicted her literature. It is a subject that is as evergreen as it is topical and that needs greater attention. It is therefore not lost on me, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, to say it is a malicious enterprise that has in turn tend to be pervasive and pernicious to the detriment of our nation's economy, history and education. Lesotho would have realize great economic growth provided the conditions intertwined with publishing were soothing and thoroughly not to be missed. Since we have multitudes of writers who are always eager to draft manuscripts, but suffice it to say the crippling circumstances have stunted such development and give inclination to fear and fast to the aforesaid writers. I cannot agree more that there is a place for offers in Lesotho 
due to the his due to the history this country holds. Be that as it may, those who have observed Lesotho have pronounced vividly that the problem is not with our authors. In fact, we have forests of authors in our mountain kingdom, which begs the fundamental question. What is the definite problem noted with publishing in Lesotho? The problem is that we have succeeded rather paradoxically to create an environment that has given an inclination to writers to draw deep into their own pockets, provided they want an inscription of their names on monuments. It is therefore extremely thorny for others to publish. We who are gathered here today are therefore posing an essential question. What must we then do to salvage these monocles that have inadvertently crippled our economy, education and history as a nation? Those who were alive then and those who have been made alive courtesy of history will remember the, 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 president, the first president of Mali, Modibo Keita, who was as eloquent as he was outstanding in asserting that mental capture is the worst thing that the erstwhile colonizers did to our African men. Even unwittingly, we enjoy the colonizers' things. No sooner had we been delivered from the yoke of colonization than the feed of amnesia set in. We have forgotten that we are Africans and we are gravitating towards London, Paris, and Lisbon. In Lesotho, our greatest joy and love is when our children are reading Animal Farm by George Orwell at the detriment of Basotho, at the detriment of the work of Basotho offers. It was Alphonse Baptiste Picard in his 18. 1849 journal, where he was, where he says eloquently in French, plus la chance, plus si la même chance, which can be translated as the more things change, the more things remain the same. Be that as it may, things will begin to happen differently if we reawaken and reorient by doing things, by doing what was described by Kenya's renowned novelist. Ngugi Watsiongo in his book, Decolonizing the Mind, since the mind is the standard of the man. Unless and until and unless we exercise the ghosts of low self-esteem, we will never achieve anything since personal conquest is the beginning of self-esteem and self-discovery. We must, in the nature of things, remove the inferiority complex, which was described by other civilizations that Africans are uh, merely hewers of wood and drawers of water for other civilizations. We must embrace our own customs, authors, and history. That is why today, therefore, I'm telling us, ladies and gentlemen, that there must be a deliberate conspiracy of institutions to deviate the circumstances that they aided the reins to catch us when it comes to writing. I therefore ask our government through the legislation and judiciary to enact the intellectual property law to protect our young men and women who write from those who engage in craft. <laughs> Furthermore, I agree with, with what the Kenya's renowned scholar and prolific writer, Professor Ali Almin Mazirui, in his television program entitled Africa, the Triple Heritage, says curiously and passionately as, at once that Africa produces what she does not consume and consumes what she does not produce. <laughs> this aforementioned statement is increasingly typical since we have academics who have published theses and articles of scintillating importance. However, our education system does not feature those. I again ask the Ministry of education through the Teaching Service Commission to incorporate the works of Basutu into our curriculum, not of the Askoel colonizer, since it is only then that we shall be able to perfect the words of one philosopher who said, there is no wisdom in teaching your children the customs and, and traditions of, civil, of a certain civilization unless they are recognized they are recognized as mili military strategies. Last but not least, 
we ask the Ministry of Tourism to call upon investors to come and erect publishing companies in Lesotho so that we do not have to grapple with forests of taxes and other hidden costs after publishing beyond the borders of our country. <laughs> to, to the authors of the Kingdom of Lesotho, I have the conviction that this launch will pump determination and enthusiasm to the pulmonary artery that leads to the heart of writing bedtime stories of our beloved country. I urge you to keep the history of this nation so well that the living, the dead, and the unborn could not do it any better. Therefore, in the words of Congo's first president and prime minister, Petris Emery Lumumba, we shall be able to say the history of this country will be written by her sons and daughters. You know, I've been given an honor to give a, sp a speech address not to preach or pontificate. So as I draw to the last segment of my presentation, afford me a little luxury to say I can still hear through the vicissitude of time the most renowned Pan-Africanist and the first president of the Republic of Ghana, Osajevo Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, when he writes that Africa needs a new type of citizen a dedicated, honest, and informed person, a person who is submerged to the service of the nation and mankind, a person who abhors greed and detests vanity, a person whose humility is his strength and integrity, his greatness. I'm telling us, ladies and gentlemen, that indeed, if Lesotho is to rise at, as it should and must, it must do so on our shoulders, our generation has a solemn duty to pass over the baton to yet another generation. Let it be remembered when the dust settles from our bones that we have passed the baton. My happiness was indeed the happiness of Osage for Dr. Kwame Nukuruma is that the greatness of Africa will not be realized in our life. Our, our happiness is that we have planted the tree of African greatness. Another generation will water that tree Another generation will prune it. Another generation will enjoy her shade. Lastly, <laughs> lastly, allow me, Program Director, Madam, on behalf of the authors of the Mountain Kingdom of Lesotho, on behalf of the members of the Pielo Lumumba Foundation Lesotho Chapter, as one of its directors, as 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 the, founder of, as the founder and trustee of the Votata Kennedy Silas Foundation, finish off by saying, Asante Sana, Professor Patrick Lok Otieno Lumumba, for honoring our invitation to deliver a lecture on leadership. Let me also express my, my profound gratitude to every one of you in this assembly today. May the Holy Ghost usher in us everlasting peace and legitimate unity in our diversity. May God bless Africa. May he bless our beloved mountain kingdom, Hot of Ula Nala. Interpretation.
the Madam Program Director, Rena Ms. Maga. I have a gentleman, Sorelle, in the world, fellow of war. Allow me a disjunction. As you have been instructed me to take a podium to express my special thanks and my special respect to His Majesty King, the other state, the Right Honorable the Prime Minister, Dr. Mwekes Mayuru, Honorable Deputy Prime Minister, Honorable Ministers of His Majesty's Government, in particular Minister of Defense, Minister of um, Education and Training, Minister of Tourism, Culture and Environment. Of course, they have been represented here by their senior officers, the likes of that day, the Tibelan, who has just come here and then is now done. In our midst, we have honorable member of the Senate, Professor Nkosan Luda Mahao. That day we acknowledge your presence. Our distinguished guest, Professor Patrick Limumba. Then we are going to come to you, Madam Advocate Busi, the motivator, indeed our source of inspiration. Thank you so much, Madam, for being with us. Chairman of the BKS Foundation, Advocate Muswari, and you are distinguished members, the Social Defense Force High Command, all members of the Social Defense Force in particular, Airmen Silas of the Resolute Defense Force, Airwin, who is a great man today. <laughs> Members of the press fraternity, I will also observe our distinguished DJs who are really making this event live, indeed, and vivid. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Lieutenant General Lezuera, the Chief of Defense Staff of the Central Defense Force. It is my honor and privilege to be part of this auspicious occasion of the launch of a set of good books authored by M. and Botata Kennedy Silas of the Central Defense Force Airwin. It should be recalled that the first time we converged in this manner, as has been alluded, was in February 2020 when you launch this first novel, The Required. Of course, uh, I've been privileged to be the first consumer of that, because by then, when he started to produce it, I mean, uh, I think it was the first draft or so. Uh, I, was, uh, I was still his immediate commander then as, at the Social Defense Force Air Wing. So I benefited to read it. And then, uh, <laughs> in that regard, I was so amazed about this potential in this right man. This young man has huge potential and has made us proud again when he won one of the leading literary awards last year, though we never came together to celebrate that accomplishment in this manner due to COVID protocols and restrictions. Today we are gathered here on the same token to celebrate another achievement of his works. The gentleman has outdone himself with his set book of, set of books, comprising a sequel to his debut novel, and also a biography narrating the life of one of the sons of Lesotho, whom from humble beginnings had succeeded to make major strides in his legal profession. In this, in this context, we are referring to Africa Moswari, Maketa Moswari. Ladies and gentlemen, as we all know, M. S. Silas is in military profession uh, of one of special service arms within our army structure, where, among other attributes, emphasis is always made on bravery that is trailed into every serviceman during his basic military training. And yet, I want to spell it out that this young man is brave indeed to have ventured into this literary profession where we usually hear newcomers like him being critiqued into submission by unforgiving captains of this fraternity. He did not just end there. 
for he also forged forward and endeavored to establish a foundation named after him, BKS. At this juncture, allow me to seize this opportunity to applaud the Silas Foundation, which has worked tirelessly around the clock to make this event a resounding success. On behalf of the Sutter Defense Force Command, officers and other ranks, uh, and other ranks in terms of rank and file, I wish to express my, our heart gratitude to the leadership of this prestigious foundation, his family, and his family for the sterling job they have done in nurturing and molding these young men into a soldier come author of this stature and has he is now the national asset to have been grown up to where he is now today. Foundation, BKS, coined the terms of bringing Professor Pelo Lumumba on our midst today. The topic of today that he is going to talk about, following what every speaker on stage has been saying, emphasizing the importance of our Africanism, emphasizing the importance of us as African children, children of the soil, to realize what we made of, we're different. We thought it would be fitting for today, for the topic of the day, to be Lesotho, what now? The way forward, as informed by the historical lessons from the five as well leaders of Africa, Kim Mushoshwe the first, Dr. Kwame Nkuruma, Captain Thomas Sankara, Colonel May, Mahoma Gaddafi, and Dr. John Makufuli. Those were the five leaders of Africa. They came and coined what Africa should be. So looking at their leadership and what they stood for, what if, what of, what is to become of Lesotho now? So that is the theme of the day. The sub themes will be our political reawakening. What about our economic reorientation and our social cohesion? With those two, three topics based on the five leaders of Africa, we get to listen to Professor Pielo Lumumba as he delivers his keynote speech 
for the great launch. Professor Lumumba is the founder of the PLO Lumumba Foundation and a consultant with Lumumba and Lumumba Advocate, a member of Lesotho Justice Group, AG, AJSG. He's written so many files, articles, and published books on Africa and Africanism. Gave memorial speeches across the world about how we become and get to embrace our Africanism. So today, we get to welcome him as we mark the launch of the two books by our very own Dr. Butata. So what is going to happen is we get to grace, we get to ask the greatest Pan-African of all time, who is an army today. So what is happening, there will be a couch there, he'll be seated on the couch. Only three questions from the audience. And we'd like you to have that, we should. Based on what he would have iterated and talked to us today, we get to ask him questions and then he gets to answer us. We do it the talk show way at the great launch. Isn't that fancy? <laughs> it is, we do it our own way, we coin it our own way. That's what it is. So, ladies and gentlemen, at this point in time, help me in welcoming our key old speaker with a standing ovation, Professor Fiolo Mumuja. Thank you, thank you very much. And let me start by recognizing in our midst uh, the Chief of Staff of the Lesotho Defense Forces, the senior military officers here present, uh, the senators here present, members of parliament here present, representatives of different departments of government, my learned friends who are here present, and of course, the man in whose honor we are assembled here, Botata Kennedy Silase. I'm told Silase is the Lesotho version of Silas, which is a very good thing. At the very outset, let me congratulate you for taking time out of your very busy schedule as a serving military officer to write not one not two, but three books, and many more coming. And I'm happy to be present on the occasion of the launch of your two books, Recoil, which is a sequel to your original book, Recoil, and the biography that you've written against all odds. Many have spoken before me and have repeated what we know, that Africa has sometimes been described as a literary desert. That is to mean that not so many books come out of the continent. But I think that is no longer true. Many Africans are now writing in different areas, in fiction, in the sciences, in history, in biographies, and in autobiographies. Today, you add to the number of young Africans who are committing pen to paper and producing celebrated books. And it's very important to recognize that you are doing so during the year that has been dedicated by the African Union 
in the spirit of Africa Agenda 2063 as the year of art, culture, and heritage. I congratulate you. I also congratulate you for establishing a foundation which I'm informed is very active in addressing the plight of fellow Basutu. There is wisdom in doing that. We can never change the world, but we can make our contribution. If one were to be melodramatic about it, one would say it takes droplets to make an ocean. Your foundation is such a droplet. And when history is written of your country, I am certain that you will find a paragraph if not a whole chapter. You have sat here as the head of the Lesotho military who is your superior saying good things about you. That doesn't happen too often. Don't take it for granted. You sat here and you've listened to your commanding officer saying good things about you, that doesn't come too often. It has been said of you that you've not only been recognized here in Lesotho, but you have been recognized in the continent of Africa, and that you have been recognized in the world. This is just but the beginning. This is just but the beginning of a long journey which we pray and hope will make you stand out and shine as an African literary giant. It is the great Chinua Achebe who said, in the days that we were not gender sensitive, that a chick that will grow into a cock is hatched on the first day, is seen on the first day that it hatches. I look at you and I see a cock. That does not mean that one that turns into a hen is no lesser, but because you are male, you are a cock. <laughs> I've been asked on the occasion of this book launch to talk about Africa, to talk about this continent, this continent that has known many trials and tribulations, and is not mine to repeat those trials and tribulations. We know them. If it was an occasion for talking about history, I would talk about slavery, but we know about it. If it was an occasion to talk about colonization, I would talk about colonization, but we know about it. If it were an occasion to talk about neocolonization, I would talk about it because it's alive and well, even as I speak. Many African countries now pride themselves of being independent. But I dare question our independence. Of course, we now govern ourselves politically. Of course, we now have national anthems. Of course, we now have our defense forces. Of course, we now have things that define who we are. And there is something good about that. And it also re helps to remind us of the leaders who sacrifice that we may be where we are although that is only but the beginning. You, the people of Lesotho, remember one of your greatest men, King Moshe Eshoi, and you will remember of him that when the white man came here, he was able to resist gallantly. And this mountain republic in many ways preserved our culture because he was a brave man who led brave people 
And that is why you proudly say the mountain kingdom of Lesotho. That is why the people of Lesotho still retain their culture. That is why even when you wear your now much more improved blankets, you do so with pride and dignity. That is why when you speak your language, you speak it with dignity. And that is why you are proud people, because in your midst there lived a man, there lived a king who was proud not only about the culture of his people, but about the culture of the continent of Africa. And that is why this afternoon you said, as I talk about the leadership of Africa, I should remember him, and remember him I do. You've also said that I should remember the Osagie for Kwame Nkrumah. But who can forget the Osagie for Kwame Nkrumah? And it's always instructive that when Nkrumah entered the political scene in Africa, it was different. When for the first time, the world started recognizing him as a great African icon in 1945 in Manchester, in the United Kingdom, during the seventh meeting of Pan-Africanism. He was invited by those who were then fighting to regain their independence in what was then known as the Gold Coast. And no sooner had he arrived in the Gold Coast that we now refer to as Ghana, there was a difference. It was as if the Ghanaian Freedom Movement had received an injection of intellectual steroids was never the same again. And I dare say that Africa has never been the same again since that Ghanaian colossus bestrode the continent. He led Ghana or Gold Coast to regain independence as Ghana on the sixth day of March 1957. And he was always very clear even in those early days that the independence of Ghana meant nothing unless the rest of Africa was free. He spoke times without number after that. In 1958, he summoned all the leaders of the then independent African countries in Accra, Ghana, and repeated it, reminding his audience that Africa had to unite because if she did not unite she would be weak and he did not stop there in 1961 in Casablanca Morocco he once again reminded his audience that the 53 African countries that had been carved out in Berlin in 1884 and 1885 were created in the image of the European powers. And that if they did not unite, Africa would be weak. He was right. He did not stop there. In 1963 in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, on the 25th day of May, 1963, he reminded his audience, comprising of the leaders of the then freed African countries, 32 of them, he told them, let us unite now before you become used to your independence and your sovereignty, he said. Let us leave here, he said, having appointed a committee of foreign ministers to come up with a program to create one common market in Africa, to create one currency in Africa, to create one defense force in Africa, 
to ensure that all Africa has one passport. They listened to him not. And he said, if we did not, if we do not do so, Africa would remain weak economically and politically. He reminded his audience that if we did not unite, the imperialists would come back under neo-colonialism and they would manipulate us and would be fighting amongst ourselves as to who was Anglophone, who was Lucophone, and who was Francophone. And he reminded his audience that we who are talking about unity, we would be eliminated through manufactured coup d'etats and civil wars, as if he was a prophet. In 1966, he was eliminated via coup d'etat when he was on a peace mission in Hanoi, in Vietnam. And he's instructive that between 1966 and 1972, all the speeches and the books and, this, and everything relating to Kwame Nkrumah was banned in Ghana. That is how he was disgraced until 1972 when Ignatius Kutu Achampong became the president. That is when the process of the rehabilitation of the Osage for Kwame Nkrumah commenced in earnest. Today, when we talk about leadership and African unity, you think of no other name other than the Osage for Kwame Nkrumah. Sometimes, when I talk about African unity, and I talk about it often, there are those who say, like they said of those great Africans before, that we are intellectually lazy. That is why we are talking about African unity. We are lazy, and we think that unity will just come by our pronouncing abracadabra. No. We are not intellectually lazy. We know when we talk about unity, we are not talking about the unity of the graveyard, no. We are talking about unity in diversity. We are talking about the unity that will enable Africans to travel across the continent so that when I come here into the kingdom of Lesotho, you don't have to ask me for a passport. I look forward to that day. I look forward to the day when I come here, I do not have to grapple with a different telephone code. There are 53 telephone codes in Africa. Lisutu is 266. Saddens me. If only we could have one like the United States of America, it would be much better. When I come here, having flown, if I were to fly directly from Nairobi, Kenya to Maseru, I would not need another COVID test because in the United States of America, you fly from Boston, Massachusetts to San Francisco in California, six hours. You don't need another COVID test. But when I do so in Africa, I need another COVID test. The poorest continent or in the world, spending money where it ought not to be spent. We are not intellectually lazy. Some say that we are romantic, that we romanticize the Union of Africa. How can we romanticize such an important thing? Kingdom of Lesotho is a great kingdom, but its population at best is only two million. If you are in the business of manufacturing two million, a market of two million is not sufficient. But when we unite, and we remove the tariff and non-tariff barriers standing in our way. 
Lesotho will produce beef and there will be a market of 1.4 billion. Lesotho could be the Switzerland of Africa. Or is it that Switzerland will become the Lesotho of Europe? Perhaps that is the better way to put it. So today when we talk about leadership and you ask me to talk about those leaders, that is the message that they were sending to us. And you ask me to talk about Thomas Sankara, perhaps the younger generation thinks that the Osage for is too remote in history. The man in whose honor we are assembled here today, Kennedy, only reads about the Osage for Kwame Nkrumah in history books. But Thomas Sankara lived when you are alive. He was here in Burkina Faso in 1983. He was a military man just as you are. He participated in a process that eliminated a neo-colonial regime. The country was then known as Upper Volta. He said, why are we called Upper Volta? He changed the name into Burkina Faso the land of the upright man and he said that the people of Burkina Faso would be called the Bukinabe, the upright man. He came at a time when Burkina Faso could not feed ourselves and he said that we can feed ourselves. He said that we can produce enough food to export. He said that we shall no longer be controlled from Paris, France. They took him out in 1987 and as I speak now a trial is going on in Ouagadougou people who are led to have taken him out courtesy of the colonial power France the spirit of Thomas Sankara is the spirit that we need now so that Africa can recognize ourselves so that Africans can realize that we have the ability to do things for ourselves how I feel that if Thomas Sankara was here, perhaps working jointly with others, this continent would now have a vaccine of our own. We are going through a pandemic, but I'm quite certain that the Basutu, like all Africans, are waiting for the British to give them AstraZeneca. You are waiting for the Americans to donate to you Moderna or Johnson and Johnson. You are waiting for the Russians to give you Sputnik. And you are waiting for the Chinese to give you Sinovac. For how long will Africa be begging? And you tell me you are independent? Oh, Makame says that it is dependent independence. And when you are independent and you are dependent, I'll not answer the question, just tell me, are you independent? That is what Thomas Sankara was talking about. Then you asked me about Muammar al-Gaddafi. Like all great men, he made mistakes. And as Julius Kambarage Nyerere of Tanzania used to say, great men make great mistakes. Because when you dare to do great things, sometimes you make great mistakes. But there is a sense in which he also had beautiful ideas. I remember him saying, for how long shall Africa depend on the currency of others? You know, when you travel across Africa, and you have the things that you and me have in our pockets here in Lesotho, you have Malot. When you cross the border, you meet the Ram. When you cross the border and you go to Botswana, you meet the Pula. When you go to Angola, you meet the Kwanzaa. When you go to Malawi, you meet the Kwacha. When you go to Zambia, you meet the Kwacha. You go to Tanzania, you meet the shilling. You go to Kenya, you meet the shilling. You go to Rwanda, you meet the franc. 
you go to Burundi, you meet the Frank, you go to Ethiopia, you meet a totally different currency, and you go to Mozambique, you meet the medical, and all of our currencies, the 33 of them, are useless pieces of paper. <laughs> They are useless because, as evidence shows, 80% of all transactions undertaken in Africa are terminated in the dollar. Gaddafi was saying, no, the time has come that Africans must have their own currency, backed by African gold. That is what Africa must be thinking about when we talk about African unity. That is what we are thinking about and that is what we are talking about. And you asked me to remember a man with whom I had a long conversation about Africa, John Joseph Pombe Magufuli. You know, when John Joseph Pombe Magufuli came into Tanzania, he came in for a short time, but he demonstrated to the world that it can be done with the resources of Tanzania. And I think the man who put it best was Lazarus Makati Chakwera, the president of Malawi on the occasion of the oration that he gave for eight minutes during the funeral of John Joseph Pombe Magufuli. And not repeat the oration, but he said in effect that the world did not know that there existed a John Joseph Pombe Magufuli who could demonstrate to the world that you can build a dam without borrowing a cent. that you could do things in your country by using the resources of your own country, that you could re-inject a people with an enthusiasm that gives them self-esteem they did not know until John Joseph Pombe Magufuli came. But he is with our Lord now. What we can do now when we remember those five leaders and many more because Africa has had other great leaders in the political arena, you can mention the man who was mentioned a, a little earlier here the, from Mali, Modibo Keita. And you remember that it is Modibo and Seko Ture of Guinea and of course Kwame Nukuruma of Ghana who started to create something that would have led to African unity. And it's not only Modibo that was great. Amilka Cabral in Guinea-Bissau was also a great man, as was Julius Nyerere and many others, Ahmed Ben Bella, the old ones will remember. But what lessons do we learn here now? Today, you and me recognize how weak Africa is. Writing in 1963 in a book entitled Africa Must Unite, Kwame Nkrumah says, Africa may be in a position to free herself politically, she may even be in a position to free herself economically. But my fear is the psychosocial impact of colonization. The European has succeeded in demonstrating and in telling the African that he is inferior and somehow the Africa still believes that he is inferior. He said that that will take a little longer to eliminate. The European has made the African hate what is African and love what is European. And today, 
When I look at Africa, even in the most mundane of things, it pains me that the Osagiefo was right. Because the battle is the battle of the minds. We of the old generation, and I believe it is also true here in Lesotho, when you have gone to school and you are in the middle class, you don't want your children to speak your mother tongue. You want them to speak English. When they speak Sesotho, you warn them. That is not good. We love the things that the colonialists taught us. If you go to the former French colonies, they want them to speak French. If you go to the former Portuguese colonies, you want them to speak Portuguese. And we do not stop there. When we go into the restaurants, the food that we order and love is English, French, complete by describing potato chips as French fries, <laughs> even when they are grown here in Lesotho. And even our youngsters, the things that they love, if it is football, they don't love your football. Young men, are busy on a daily basis watching English football. Manchester United, Arsenal, Chelsea. And if they move away from England, they go to Paris, Paris Saint-Germain. If they move a little, they go to Spain, Real Madrid, Barcelona, and if they move away, they go to Italy, Roma, oh, Africa. You'll never hear a young football enthusiast in Lesotho talking about Kaiser Chiefs, or Orlando Pirate, or Mufulira Wanderers, or St. George's in Ethiopia. Our minds are captured. And that is why those leaders that you are talking about are relevant today. Because until the day that we liberate our minds, we will remain weak. So what is the message today? The message today is, as has been told, it was said very early on, the good brigadier told us that when the hunters write the stories. It is the exploit of the hunters that is spoken about, not the glory of the animals. The young lady who was the program director told us, and we remember this, that it is not the glory of the lion that is talked about, but the glory of the hunter. In my analogy, we Africans have been the lion for too long. The time is now that we begin writing our stories. And that is why, Kennedy, you are doing a great thing. You are now telling us stories as told by a person who is from Lesotho, a Basotho, telling your own story. You are not allowing some European historian some European anthropologists to come and tell you what to write. You are writing it from the depths and the inner sanctums of your mind and your heart. It is only in that way that Africa will be liberated. So, ladies and gentlemen, when today we are assembled here primarily for the purpose of launching a book, it is also incumbent upon us to go back and think of our leaders not simply as people whose ideas are fossilized in time, but as people whose ideas can be activated for a general benefit. So what do I see when I look at Africa today, standing on the shoulders of those great leaders of old? 
When I stand on the shoulders of King Moshe Shoe the first of the Basutu people, this is what I see. I see an Africa where people are proud of their culture. Because that is what he fought for. I see a people who are proud of being the Basoto, but also proud of being Africans. I see a people who are proud and dignified. I see a people who recognize that our dignity lies in our diversity, standing on the shoulders of Moshe Eshoi the first I can see it. When I stand on the shoulders of the Osagia for Kwame Nukuruma, accuse me all you want, call me intellectually lazy, call me a romanticist, call me naive. But when I stand on the shoulders of the Osagia for Nukuruma, this is the Africa that I see. I see an Africa one day where there will be a single passport for all of us. I see an Africa one day where there will be a single telephone code for all of us. I see that Africa. I see an Africa one day where there will only be one ambassador for the entire continent of Africa at the United Nations. I see an Africa one day that will be sitting as a permanent member of the UN General Assembly, I see that Africa. I see an Africa one day where the defense forces of Lesotho will be merged into an African defense force, I see that Africa. I see an Africa one day where the Maloti will be dead, I see an Africa where the Rand will be dead, the Shilling will be dead, the Kwanzaa will be dead, the quencher will be dead, the beer will be dead, all these useless currencies will be dead, and there will only be one currency, the Afro, or whatever name we choose to give it. I see an Africa one day where we will not be walking around the world with bowels in our hands begging for vaccines. I see an Africa where when we go into the classrooms, our children will not be taught the parts of a tree, but they'll be taught the value of a tree. And we shall make our own medicine. I see that Africa. That Africa I see when I stand on the shoulders of the Osagie for Kwame Nkuruma. I see an Africa as I stand on the shoulders of Thomas Sankara, an Africa where we will define ourselves an Africa where we will reclaim the thing that had been taken out of us so that like Thomas Sankara came and renamed Upper Volta into Burkina Faso. I see an Africa one day where Livingstone in Zambia will no longer be Livingstone. It shall have an African name. I see an Africa where there will be no Blanta. I see an Africa where there will be no Victoria Falls. We shall call it Musio Tunya Falls. I see that Africa. I see an Africa where all these colonial names will disappear. I see an Africa where my children and children's children will no longer bear the name of Patrick, which I have no relation to, but will have an Africa name. I see that Africa. And when I stand on the shoulders of Muammar al-Gaddafi, I see an Africa where we will have unity in diversity where the color of our skin will not be the determinant factor, but our fidelity to the continent of Africa. I see that Africa. And when I stand on the shoulders of John Joseph Pombe Magufuli, I see an Africa that will utilize our own resources so that when she is dealing with the Chinese, when she is dealing with the Europeans and the Americans and the Indians, we, she will be dealing with them on the basis of equality. An Africa that will sit at the dinner table of civilization, not under the table where she is eating crumbs. I look at that Africa and I see it when I stand on the shoulders of John Joseph Pombe Magufuli. And I could stand on many other shoulders. I could stand on the shoulder of Patrice Samuel Lumumba and say that I'll see an Africa where history is written by us 
in the same manner that Kennedy Selassie has now written here today and we are celebrating. I can also stand on the shoulders of Malimu Kambarage Nyerere and on the shoulders of Samora Moises Mashal and say with Samora, Aluta continua victoria except. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, when I stand on the shoulders of these great men, I see great things. And as my good sister, Madam Boshio said, I have no nightmare, big dreams. And I will not allow nightmares to stand in my sight. I only know that those dreams will become realities. But the last time I checked, when you dream, you must wake up. Otherwise, you cannot fulfill those dreams. So the good old general, we will not continue in our slumber. We are dreaming, we are waking up, and Africa shall be great. And today I'm happy because we are celebrating a young man, a young man born only in 1991, a young man who has gone to school and read mathematics and computer science, a young man who has chosen to rise through the ranks. He's a private, he's an airman, a young man who is winning accolades, a young man who has founded a foundation, a young man who is telling other young men and women it can be done, it must be done, because it is our duty to do it. So ladies and gentlemen, it is a joyous occasion here today as we celebrate Africa and as we imagine an Africa that will come and it shall come. Those who are doubting us, will be disappointed and it is our duty to disappoint them. If it does not come during our lifetime, it shall come during the lifetime of our children. And if it does not come during the lifetime of our children, it shall do so during the lifetime of our grandchildren. And if it does not come during their lifetime, it shall come regardless. God bless. Basutu, on whose shoulders are you standing on? On whose shoulders are we standing on? As we embark on this journey of life and our political reawakening and social cohesion, let's remember the vigor, the zeal, of which Professor Lumumba said it. On whose shoulder are you standing on as you overlook the Africa that we all need? On whose shoulders are you standing on as we see the Africa that we dream of? This is our home. It shall forever remain that way. So, ladies and gentlemen, I hope we were standing listening as we he was articulating the themes of today. It is at this point in time where I call upon the Devotata to the stage to be next to the professor as we do our talk show. We said we do it the great launch way. The Devotata. <laughs> Give him the great lunch key, do, the great lunch key, do. Let's give him the great lunch key, do. So I don't know the protocol, how this will work, because I don't see, but I'll be standing here. Uh, we can only allow a few questions, right? For our very own professor who's on stage now. So I uh, will be hoisting the whole thing. Uh, this is how we're going to do it. Raise some hands and then there'll be a protocol we can come to you 
And then we can only take three questions, three answers, just like that. We're doing it the great lunch style. Yeah. Oh, this one. Okay. That advocate Maheta will be helping me administer questions. The mic? Can I see the mic? Okay. You can come, we can come with that. We're doing it to introduce ourselves and then we administer questions to our professor. I'll reiterate it in case it didn't happen. Uh, good evening, uh, son of the Swai and son of the revolution. How are you say? Uh, my name is Musa Mayama. Uh, I'm the entrepreneur. I have a question for you, son of revolution. I've been following you. One of the things that uh, you are against is the death penalty. Since I've been following your videos, um, I've been also following some um, some current. In China, China is doing so well for fighting corruption. One of the greatest problems of African continent is corruption. Um, one of the greatest problem of the Africa is the corruption. But China they've been using um, death penalty as a way of fighting corruption. I just want to know how, as an African continent, we are going to fight this situation. Because according to me, I think. China is doing so well, and the level of corruption is, is decreasing because of the, uh, 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 the method they're using. But you are against the, the death penalty. I just want to know uh, how China, how Africa will deal, will deal with uh, corruption. The second question is, there's a problem between um, uh, Sudan uh, and Egypt and Ethiopia concerning Nile River. How can we come with solution with the African continent? Because I know I'm a citizen of Lesotho, but I'm talking about Africa because it's my home, which means the problem, the problem of uh, 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 I mean the problem of Sudan or Ethiopia or Egypt is my problem. How can we, as an African continent, can we solve the problem, uh, uh, that problem? That's my question, question to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank, thank you, Ndadema. We appreciate that one. So there's two questions, Professor. Let's open. Let me start with the Ethiopian question. If you read history, you will remember. You'll remember one of the things that happened in 1963 during the founding of the Organization of African Unity, one of the things that was uh, stated in the charter of the OAU was that African countries would respect the boundaries that were inherited from the colonialists. That is the boundaries that were established in Berlin in 1884 and 1885. And the argument put forth at that time by both Nkrumah and Nyerere was that if we started to redraw those boundaries, then there would be conflict within the continent of Africa that would never be dealt with. And Nkrumah reminded the audience that even as we are sitting here, there are conflicts in Ethiopia and there are conflicts in Somalia. But he said, in order to fight these problems, one of the things that we ought to do is to grow towards African unity because when we talk about African unity, we are not saying that we dissolve these units. They'll remain administrative units within the continent of Africa. But the resources would be used continentally. So that when we talk about African unity, we are not saying we are dissolving Lesotho. We are saying that Lesotho will remain an administrative unit within the continent of Africa. We are saying that Angola will remain an administrative unit. In the same way, if you know the history of the United States of America, 
when the founding fathers met in Philadelphia in 1776, there were only 13 states. As we speak now, there are 50 of them because they, show, they, 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 they were able to show that unity can strengthen them. So in 1963, we talked about the inviolability of the independent boundaries. And in 1964 in Cairo, in Egypt, that is when the doctrine of the inviolability of inherited boundaries were actually stated. There is a third meeting that we don't talk about as often as we should, the 1965 meeting in Accra, Ghana, where Nkrumah reminded them, we are going to have conflicts. If we don't unite, one year later Nkrumah was overthrown in a military coup. What then was the problem? When Africa was being administered by the European powers, if you go to West Africa, you'll find that the colonies like what is now Cote d'Ivoire, what is now Senegal, what is now Cameroon, were all French territories. To come back to the Nile, in the Nile Valley, the British controlled Egypt, they controlled Sudan, they controlled Uganda. And where, when therefore the Nile Treaty was entered into in 1929 and 1949, they were for the benefit of the British, because they looked at these as their own territory. Today, Sudan is an independent sovereign state. South Sudan is an independent sovereign state. Ethiopia is an independent sovereign state. The Nile flows from Uganda on its way to the Mediterranean Sea. The Blue Nile originates from Lake Tana in Ethiopia. If we were one Africa and we thought about the use, because in my view, the Ethiopians are entitled to use the waters of the Nile, but they must use them in a manner that does not affect South Sudan, who also need it. They must not use it in a manner that affects Egypt, who also use it. Imagine if we were one united Africa, that conflict would never arise. Because we would be talking about one Africa. As it is now, every country is selfish. And they are saying it is your way, my way, or the highway. And we have seen that that is not the only conflict. About two weeks ago, the International Court of Justice made, delivered a ruling which, uh, between Kenya and Somalia on the maritime boundary. Once again, the problem is because we are divided. And these things are now beginning to create conflict. And it's not only in that part of the world. You know that there is a conflict of boundaries in the Bakasi Peninsula there was between Nigeria and Cameroon. In a nutshell, I'm saying, if indeed the African Union is of the view that by the year 2063 we are going to have a more united Africa, we now have the Africa continental free trade area that is going to eliminate tariff and non-tariff barriers, why don't we constitute a committee of eminent Africans, including scholars, to deal with these boundary problems so that we share in the resources. I'm aware that South Africa gets some of its water from Lesotho. That is the way it should be done. If you have water and you can use some and spare some to South Africa and they pay you something which I think they should, why should that happen? If the Egyptians and the Sudanese are telling the Ethiopians, instead of filling your dam within 10 years, make it 14 years so that we can benefit, what is wrong with that? If the maritime boundary between Kenya and Somalia is a source of conflict, why don't we have joint exploitation? These are the things that we are saying should be dealt with in an African continent. But if you look at the Ethiopian conf conflict, you now see it being externalized. It is the Egyptians, it is the Turks, it is the Qataris, it is the Americans who want to tell us what to do. And if we are not careful, 
they'll do what they want. And we will be left with the dead baby in our arms. The sooner we realize, the safer we are. Question number two, death penalty. Justice according to man is prone to error. Courts of law make findings of law which sometimes do not represent the absolute truth. There are many cases in which you've been involved and the lawyers here have been involved in where people are convicted and sentenced to death on the basis of evidence which upon scrutiny is found to have been wanting. And many people have been executed while they were innocent. That is why I hold the view that human beings must always be given a second chance. In, some, in fact, sometimes I think that death is not even a punishment. If somebody has committed heinous offenses and you then kill him, the fellow is up, I don't know whether in heaven or hell, but the fellow doesn't know. We want the fellow to be present here, to be seeing how things should be done. And I do not believe that China is the only example of a country where death penalty is a success. There are countries which don't have death penalties and where the fight against corruption is doing well. You go to Botswana. Botswana is doing relatively well in the fight against corruption. You go to Rwanda. They are doing relatively well in the fight against corruption. In fact, the corrupt, if you want to punish the corrupt people, this is how I think it should be done. Take away all their wealth. All of it. And because that is where it hurts most. After you've taken their wealth, if they are built, like some of them in rural Africa, they build huge buildings out of corruption money. You then put a billboard. This is now a public library. It was built out of the money stolen by so and so. When you do so, you ashamed that individual. Once you've done that, you also bar them from holding public office for life. And perhaps you introduce a ring which they wear so that people know, behold, the corrupt one is coming. There are many ways. There are many ways of dealing with the corrupt. Don't kill them. Because some of them, after a few years, then you assess them and then they can be rehabilitated and they come back to society. So they go around the society teaching people, I was once very corrupt, but I changed because of this. There are many ways. And I think Africa is now beginning to relate corruption with their plight. There was a time when many people in Africa did not relate their own suffering with corruption. Because leadership in Africa, when somebody is the minister for health and a hostel is built in your village, you think he's the one who has built it. As a friend of mine says, how do you thank an automatic teller machine? When you go into the teller machine and it produces money, now you thank it. That is your money. That is the way government is. <laughs> government has no money of its own. Government only uses the taxes that it gets from you and me. And once you do that, like in, 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 in your, if you go into the Basutu culture, the problem I think, and I'll finish on this, the problem I have and the confusion we have is the mix between English culture and our traditional culture. Amongst the Basutu, a thief. Can you allow your daughter to be married to a thief, a known thief? But if you have a thief who has stolen a lot of maloti, now we think it's different. A thief who has stolen billions of maloti is no different from one who has stolen a goat. So if you go into Basutu culture, you would be shocked at how people will become ashamed. So I think that the death penalty is a penalty that deserves no place in our statute books and that there are different ways of punishing people. Thank you. Second question. Any, any third audience? Okay. Uh, thank you. 
My name is Pius Mahase. Uh, I represent Mazino Institute. Uh, this is the only company which is behind the distribution and selling of uh, the books. So we are honored to have Ndadi Silasi being one of the offers having to have trusted us. I, I have only one question for you, Professor. Uh, my question is, if uh, some part of the, the Basuto culture or Basuto nation to mention the youth, which I believe is the one which is suffering or is bearing the consequences of the political structure, to ask you some questions or to have some advices to give, what would be your advice to our political leaders in relation to the structure of our democratic way of making laws and statutes? That is the only question that I want to believe you can deliver for us. Thank you very much. I am a, I'm a lawyer by training and, 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 and an academic in law. And, and, and one of the things that I now think about is we should do something about our laws. If you hear, and I know the lawyers who are here, we have the common law. And it is the joy of an advocate in Lesotho when they appear before the superior court, you hear them say, my Lord, as Lord Denning said, and they think they are now saying a very big thing because Lord Denning said it somewhere in England in 1950. And if they are in South Africa under the Dutch Roman law, you hear them as Lord Rebeck said, they think they are very clever. I now think otherwise. I think that we must re-examine our legal regimes and begin to infuse into our legal regime laws that make sense to us. There are certain laws of universal application, like human rights, generally of universal application. But remember, when the British came here, if you look at your penal code, it had an offense called sex against the order of nature. Do you remember in your study books? Sex against the order of nature. That is now is what is called homosexuality. Now they are telling us that there is something called LGBTQ. They have changed. When they change, they now want us to change. The Basutu and all these others had ways of dealing with this. So I think that there are certain things that are unique to a specific group of people which should be applied. And remember that culture is dynamic. What the Basutu used to do in the 18th century in respect of a particular thing is not what they would do now. In my ethnic group, for example, when one died, then they would, uh, somebody would uh, uh, take over the, the, the widow and build another house. Now, if you have a six-bedroomed house, how can you now leave that house? Culture has changed because the economy has changed. So I think that what we should look at, even this thing called democracy, the Europeans come here through various NGOs, and I'm quite certain they are here in the studio, many of them. <laughs> they tell you, <coughs> democracy means <coughs> multi-party politics multi-party politics you must have many parties in my own country I think we have over 100 political parties we create them by the day in all African countries because you create a party today you, you sell them, people create them and sell them I don't know what the situation in Lesotho is but I, I'm sure they keep on mutating why can't we have our own form of democracy institutionally? Because what is democracy? It is a government where the people are involved in decision-making processes. Whichever form it takes must be determined by us. If we do that, we'll begin to reorient. You have a kingdom because history has demonstrated to you that the stability of this nation has been maintained by that particular monarchy. Why should you do away with it? As long as that monarch is a monarch who is responsive to the needs of the people and allows the people to participate in decision-making process, that is your own democracy. And I think that if we do that, we'll be addressing the concerns that have been raised. Because ultimately, and I'm answering the last, your question in the last leap, what do people really want? 
as a human being, if you ask yourself, out of 10 people, 8 want very basic things. Water, food, shelter, education. And they want opportunities either in employment or in invention and innovation. And in this modern world, they want infrastructure for the purpose of trade and the ability to apply themselves to move out of the country and to save for themselves and for their generation. Once you do that, many one, most of us here, do you want 10 cars? You don't need 10 cars. Even if you want them, you don't need them. And many governments only need to achieve that. And how can you achieve that in the modern world? Lesotho with a population of two, two million in the Sadak region, Lesotho could become a magnet if it identified a niche, because you have a population of nearly 400 million in this region. Suppose Lesotho through the Ministry of Tourism could attract only two million tourists in this country, how many jobs would be created? directly and indirectly look at your own traditional way i have two of them at home which have been given how are you marketing those when i see i'm suited with that thing that thing can be marketed across this region and across the continent of africa and it could be like you do with louis vuitton you are you are you are proud to have louis vuitton and gucci but you are not proud to have that basutu hat it can be a multi-million shilling or maloti product. There are many things that can be done and the laws will then be made in a manner that fits that. In fact, I believe that a country like Lisut, I'm now, I've stopped answering the question, I'm now saying something that I wanted to say. <laughs> a country like Lisut can in the next 15 years have zero unemployment if it wanted. It's possible. It just needs creative thinking. Just creative thinking. I know the Chinese now have textile industries here. And if you are not very careful, they are going to take over. But this can become the hub of manufacturing in Africa. That's just deal with your taxes. Eliminate all taxes in the first 10 years because they'll pay taxes already. I don't know, I'm not an economist, but sometimes when I give examples of countries that I think can have zero unemployment in Africa, these are the three countries that I normally mention. Lesotho, Equatorial Guinea, Eswatini. And if you go down, they're asking, which clan do you come from? And they are asking the other question, how much money are you going to give us? It is in the billions. And... Africa and African politics is not easy for those who are honest. Because those who are honest also tend to be naive. That is the problem. When you are honest, you tend to be naive. Those who know how to seek power in Africa are conniving. And on a daily basis, they work at how to manipulate processes. So, Brigadier, when you retire, I'm not discouraging you to go into politics. You may. But I urge you to think very seriously. If the hygiene has been introduced in the, less, in the politics in Lesotho, then go there. But there are many other different sites of service. The assumption that is only in elective politics that you can serve your country is also misguided. I think that there are many areas in which you can serve. And ask yourself the question, in which area can I best serve? Today I run a foundation. I've never taken any money from a white man, from any white organization, never ever. The contribution that I receive deliberately are little donations from Africans and we are present in 39 African countries, 39, which means it can be done. And I think that the foundation, for example, that my good friend Silas has, he'll not just think about Lesotho, be present in South Africa, talk about agriculture. Right now, 
in the, through my foundation, we are in negotiation with the government of Malawi. We have written a proposal, I've met the president of Malawi, and we want to do something in Malawi in agriculture. So things can be done when you think big. And, and remember, and this is the last thing I'm saying, Brigadier is not a small thing in any military setup. Don't retire before you rise. When you rise, and assuming that the good uh, Lieutenant General will become a general, <laughs> and then you become, you become Lieutenant, you can write your memoirs, and there are many things that you can be done. But lastly, I say, we should also not shy away from politics. I think politics is very important. We should aim to have our best men and women in the political arena. If it is bad now, it doesn't mean it will always be bad. I think that if we bring in more people and educate people more, then the people will begin to learn that the better, the more you have good people in decision-making processes, the better the quality of your life. And never say never. The fact that we have suspended our intention does not mean that we have eliminated our intentions. Yes, never say never. But mom, isn't this what the great loan should be? Yeah. <laughs> it really should like we are enjoying this, we should have started with this. Dada <laughs> Makata, any 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 audience? Okay. Thank you. One, one. You can't. That, 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 this is a great honor. This is the great perks we get of hosting the professor. We can ask him any question and he's going to answer it. And he's enjoying it too. Mine is a short one. I am, I am Letu Gamalati. I am a practicing advocate both in Lesotho and in South Africa. I am a Soto. I'm very much inspired by what uh, my brother Silas has done. Question. In the years 1994 up to the year 2004, people in their youth in Lesotho, men and women or boys and girls, who were the best performers in high school, like top 20, 80% of them are in South Africa. And of course, it is one of Lesotho's best brains. Let me just pick from your prof to say, what can be done to retain the brains of those of our own for them to contribute in the kingdom? Because I see more of erosion than retention. I've got a tempting um, offer even right now as we speak to relocate to South Africa and to even renounce my Lesotho citizenship? That's my question. For the benefit of everybody else, advocate, please don't. <laughs> Dada Muntari, do we have any other one? Yes, you can come to the stage. Bomme, bomme, bomme. 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 Uh, thank you very much, Madam Program Director. Uh, my name is Seth Putuan from the Prime Minister's Office, and I am I feel privileged to to, to be here today. This is indeed an august uh, gathering, and. Uh, a very inspirational day, not only for us that are gathered here, but for uh, Basoto in general. And uh, uh, what you've achieved uh, today is indeed uh, notable. Uh, my question, I'll try to shorten it because I had to twist my colleague's arm to be up here. Um, Professor, I'd like to pick your brain on two things. The role of merit in the progression of Africa. Um, I'm sure you are well aware that uh, meritocracy isn't really the order of the day, uh, but it needs to be the order of the day in order for, for progress. I'd like to pick your brain on that. Couple that with uh, systems, systems in, in, in governance, um, deliberate systems in, in governance, um, not, not, not random 
random directions of whoever's in power at the time and things like that and structures, that sort of thing. I'd just like to pick your brain on that. Thank you. Kialawa, my program director. Thank you. Thank you. Let me start with uh, systems. Two years ago, I was uh, sitting in my house and I was watching the 6,000 delegates of the Chinese party meeting in Beijing. CGTN was the television. And they were reporting that the delegates there were discussing many things, including trade and other things, but they were discussing how China would be relayed to the world 100 years from that date. 100 years. Which means that none of them would be alive. And that is the agenda that they are implementing even as we speak. They have then broken it down into five years, into ten years, but it's a hundred year program. Of course it will change from time to time as different generations come. And I think in Africa we don't think that way. I think right now, I don't know what your vision is, uh, but, but because every African country has a vision. Ours is vision 2030. I don't know what the Malawi vision is. Or rather, the, 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 the Malawi vision is 2060. The Basoto vision is 20-something. It used to be 2020. Now you don't have, you, you don't have a declared vision. But, but the point that I'm making, that, and, and you who is in government, you know how short five years is. Five years is nothing. If you are in infrastructure, you want to build a dam. Can you do it in five years if you do a miracle? And therefore, it is incumbent upon people, particularly in the political class, this thing that people say, I want to leave a legacy. You can't think like that when you are thinking of a country and you are a politician whose life is so short. You've got to do your part. As to what your legacy is, that will be a judgment of history. So my own view is that systems and institutions are very critical. And you can see it in your own experience and exposure. You've seen the systems, for example, in Singapore. The systems that are in Vietnam after the Civil War, when Vietnam was reunited, is now surprising. Vietnam after the war, and it happened when you and me could hear about, read about it, Vietnam is now one of the largest producers of coffee, agriculture. You look at countries such as Sweden, producing Switzerland, producing not a single bush of cocoa, but it earns the most. You look at the diamond industry, because I think you do diamond here, yet the prices are set in Antwerp. There is not a single stone of diamond that comes out of Belgium. You should be cutting diamond. That requires deep and forward thinking. So I can't agree with you more that the political process should, to a large extent, be designed in a manner that it does not interfere with certain fundamental structures of governance which are determined to be good for the whole country over a period of course subject to revision. If you look at some of the European countries, and I hope that that is true even here in Lesotho, even the opposition says it is the loyal opposition. The opposition is loyal to the state. It is not just in the business of opposing everything and proposing nothing. It is in the duty of ensuring, because a position will not have a new set of Basutu. And the government has done. It's the same set of Basutu that you are dealing with. It is their lives. So I can't agree with you more that systems must be put in place and governance must not be based on the whims of individuals. Which brings me to the second question, meritocracy. Part of the African problem is that our best men and women are not deployed in critical places. Nepotism is one of our problems. I call it technical know-who rather than technical know-how. Who do you know? So our best men and women are not properly deployed. In many countries in Europe, America, and progressively in Asia, out of 10 people, you'll find eight are properly deployed. You are the best, and therefore you are, and you are deployed and properly compensated. 
So there is no substitute for merit. If you want a good doctor, you've got to create, you've got to have a good doctor. Good lawyer, good lawyer. Good teacher, good teacher. But if you begin to go into the arena of nepotism, that is the way you get your worst men and women in positions of influence, and it is self-evident when you look at your country because you garbage in, garbage out. Garbage in, garbage out. So if you expect people to perform beyond their capacity, they'll never perform. So every country and African countries must look at this very seriously. Bringing me to the third question that you talked about, the question that my good friend, lawyer friend talked about. I went to a meeting and during a Q&A answer like this, a lady from the audience who had listened to me said, I agree with you. She was from Zimbabwe. She was a doctor. She told me, you are telling we Africans to go back to Africa. I hear you. When I was in Zimbabwe, when I left Zimbabwe as a doctor in the hospital where I worked, when I wanted to perform surgery, there were no gloves. All the things were not there and they, my salary was the equivalent of 50 United States dollars. Should I have remained in Zimbabwe? I said no. And what is my point? My point is, if we want to retain the best men and women in our environment, let us compensate them. Yes, you compensate them accordingly. Because I do not know whether they used to say it here in Lesotho, go to school, get a good job and enjoy a good life. Now you go to school in many African countries, you go to school, get you a, a qualification, engineer, doctor, teacher, lawyer, and that is when you begin to suffer. Because your parents now say you have a qualification, you can't live in our house, and that is why you see young Africans are suffering, trying to go to the United States of America, trying to go to Europe to look for opportunities. I was recently in a place called Hargeisa in Somaliland, and a Somali gentleman who was speaking and we were talking about migration, this is what he said, and I love the say. He said, everybody would love to be at home. Unless you are home, is the mouth of a shark. Everybody would love to be at home. Every person from Zimbabwe that you see outside of the country, every African that you see in Europe, every African that you see in the United States, if you ask them, given a choice and holding all factors constant, where would you want to be? Home. The reason why people run away from home is that there are no opportunities. So in order to retain our people at home, we must create opportunities. How do you create opportunities? It doesn't mean that the people from Lesotho will not go outside. The world is a village and I expect the Basotho to go and work in South Africa. Nothing wrong with it. But I expect people to go and work in different parts of the world. Nothing wrong with it. The only problem that I have is that you become an economic refugee simply because the home is so hostile that there is nothing to do. That is the plight of Africa because we misapply resources. Look at the Chinese, and I'm sure you see them here in Lesotho, as I see them in Kenya, as I see them in different parts of Africa. Young ones, they are in their 20s and 30s, the very same age that the people who came to colonize us were, 20s and 30s, because they sent people who are unmarried without family commitment. They are the ones who came. They come here in Lesotho, in a room that is 10 by 10 feet, they leave five of them eating bowls of rice, living modestly. Within five years, they are multi-millionaires and they are sending money home. In other words, they are away from home, but they think about home. Lesotho, like all African countries, must create an environment that makes it attractive for them to become citizens who are loyal to their country. No Botswana wants to leave Botswana. 
None. I remember in 1994 when we were when we were going when we were studying. If you met a student from Botswana, the allowances that they were given by their government were attractive. Thousand dollars in 1994. They live like kings and queens. And here you are from Kenya, from Lesotho, from Uganda. When you have one hundred dollars, you think you have won lotto that somebody talked about here. So I'm saying, don't move away, don't run away from Lesotho, because if you run away from Lesotho, who is going to make Lesotho? Who is this person? Which angels have talked to you that they are coming here to do the work that you are supposed to do? Be here. Because God has blessed you, you are here in both here and there. Be here and talk to government. Governments are going to change. Those of you who are slightly older, the good general here will remember in 1960 what was Botswana, what was the Pula? Nothing. They just made a deliberate decision to make their resources useful to their people, and I think that it can be done. And you who are in government know that it can be done. We know there are difficult times for all countries because of COVID. And we know sometimes because of these tariff and tar non-tariff barriers, Lesotho becomes difficult. It becomes difficult for Lesotho to transact. Suppose you, make, you made yourself. I do not know whether you are too religious to have casinos here. But if you could make some casinos here, you become a tax haven here. Here in Lesotho, deliberate effort, what Mauritius is now doing. Look at what Mauritius is doing. They have stopped growing this nonsense sugar cane. They have now become a financial hub. Look at what Seychelles is doing. Look at what Cabo Verde is doing. In, on this continent, little islands. Look at what Dubai did. Nothing. Desert. Zero. Look at what they did. Nowadays, if you are in the middle class and you don't tell your friends you've been to Dubai in the last six months, you think you are finished. So there are many things that can happen and should happen. And, and I think that within these, I mean, I'm very impressed. When I look at uh, in Africa and, and the good generals and brigadiers here will tell you, it used to be the case that people who joined the military in many African countries are people who did not go to school. Look at the quality of our men and women in defense forces nowadays. Amazing in all sectors. And if you look at the history of countries such as the United States, you'll remember, for example, things like computers. It is the, the, the military was the home of major discoveries. We were told here, yeah, I think it's by the good uh, brigadier who told us about the history of the, the Romans and what they did. There are many things. And I know you have a defense college. I've gone to several defense colleges in Africa, to Zimbabwe, to Rwanda, and, 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 and to Kenya. There is a new leadership college in, in, in Ethiopia. And you listen to men from the military, and you are amazed. They are not just gun-bearing people. They are, they, they, they are in, there is intellectual firepower. And that is what you need. So many things can be said, and particularly in peacetime now, in peacetime now, why can't the military be involved in civilian activities? And I'm quite certain they are. You involve them in civilian activities, and in that way, they deploy their discipline and their other things in a different way. And that is how I understand, as I conclude, what my good young friend is doing here. He is in the military. There is no, he has no disciplinary problems, and he is being effective in other areas. And history has demonstrated time and time again that if you want anything done well, give it to a busy man or a busy woman. It will be done perfectly and on time. Thank you so much. Professor, those were indeed profound words that we all cherish and shall forever remember. So in, in a great style that we did, can we all give our professor the great launch applause, right? The great launch key, you know? Can we give our professor the great launch key? Oh.
ta 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 Prof, it is my honor to say thank you so much on behalf of Butada Kennedy Silasa Foundation, on behalf of everybody here. Thank you so much. You may remain seated or you choose to go while we end, uh, come to the end of our program. Can we all give him a standing ovation, Professor Lubumba, everybody? As we come to the end of our launch i have a one announcement to make uh, there is a phone lost and found phone that the owner can just approach me then we'll deal with it later so there's that phone uh, we come to the end of our launch at this point we'd like to welcome miss ML Bamalifuenla, the executive director of the BKS Foundation, to give a vote of thanks on our behalf. Thank you. Thank you.